Humans have been communicating from point A to point B for thousands of years, relying on animals, wagons, and eventually machines to help make the transfer of information easier and more reliable. In the United States, the growth of the Postal Service occurred in tandem with, and sometimes fueled, the expansion of the nation. Today we are coming to you from the Smithsonian's National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. Located in the historic City Post Office building, it houses one of the largest postal collections in the world, including stamps, trucks, trains, and even airplanes. With nearly six million objects, the collection of the National Postal Museum is the third largest in the Smithsonian. During our visit, we'll be looking at objects that represent the innovation mail has fostered with communication, transportation, and infrastructure. In this episode of STEM in 30, we're going to explore the evolution of mail delivery and its role in our daily lives. This is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. You may recognize the person behind us. He was a founding father and a prodigious inventor. But did you know that Benjamin Franklin was the first Postmaster General for the Continental Congress in 1775? Patriots living in what would soon become the United States developed their own postal system separate from the British as a way to communicate privately without interference by British authorities. This system was developed in no small part by printer William Goddard. His sister, Mary Catherine, was even appointed as one of the first female postmasters in colonial America. The next year, she was the first publisher to print a copy of the signed Declaration of Independence. The Smithsonian's National Postal Museum is dedicated to the preservation, study, and presentation of postal history and philately. Philately, that may be a new word to you. I know it was for me, so let's stamp this home so we can add it to your vocabulary. Philately is the study and collecting of postage stamps, and this museum has an amazing collection of them. The decades after the United States gained independence, the country expanded westward into lands inhabited by Native Americans or previously colonized by other European powers. All the while, the U.S. Postal Service grew to meet the demands of the growing nation. As the U.S. Postal Service itself expanded, private businesses began contracting with the post office for mail delivery services. During this period, westward expansion created a need for the Pony Express, a postal route stretching 1,966 miles across the country, connecting Missouri to California. Riders delivered mail by horse in a relay style, stopping at stations along the way. This mail delivery method was a temporary solution, lasting only 18 months while the telegram line was being built. Daniel Piazza, curator of the William Gross Stamp Gallery, gave me a tour of some of the museum's stamp collection, including original stamps from the Pony Express. Daniel, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. What we're looking at is a proof sheet of postage stamps that were issued by the United States Post Office Department in 1940 to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Pony Express. Proof sheets are some of the first sheets to come off of the printing press and they're used by employees in the printing plant to check the quality of the print, make sure that everything is printing correctly before they actually start printing millions and in some cases billions of postage stamps. Do you want to tell us what the Pony Express was? The Pony Express was an early attempt at uniting the United States mail over land by using a relay system of horse and riders between California and Missouri. And there were a series of stations all across the American West where then the next rider and a fresh horse was ready to take the mail on to the next station. Till the Pony Express in 1860, the only way that mail could travel between the East and the West Coast was by ship. It had to go either around the tip of South America or it had to go over the Isthmus of Nicaragua. So there were some issues though with encroaching on Paiute land? Many uh, native people in the American West saw the Pony Express stations as uh, 
as kind of the beachhead of advancing and encroaching American civilization. They were attacked, uh, the stations and, and the riders, culminating briefly in, in what's sometimes known as the War of the Pyramid Lake or the Paiute War in 1860. And, and the Pony Express was very much a, uh, um, a flashpoint in, that, in those conflicts. How long did the Pony Express last? You know, when I give tours of this gallery, I think probably the thing that uh, surprises visitors the most is just how short a period the Pony Express actually operated and how little mail it actually carried. Uh, so the Pony Express lasted only about 18 months. There's a lot of uh, romantic lore about how the Pony Express kept people who had moved west in contact with their families. And there's some of that, but very little. Most people did not have $5 to send a letter. Why do we have this romantic sense about the Pony Express even today? You know, it's not just us today who have this romantic idea of the Pony Express. Buffalo Bill Cody and his Wild West shows featured the Pony Express and advertised that a number of his performers were former Pony Express riders. Whether they were or they weren't is kind of iffy. Within maybe 20 or 30 years after the close of the Pony Express, already it was being romanticized. The West has always had a certain appeal, especially for Easterners, um, and I think the Pony Express just kind of ties into that lore, and it has carried it for over a century and a half. Why did the Pony Express end? What caused its demise? What really put it out of business was the arrival of the telegraph, and now messages and information could be sent electronically from one coast to the other without the need to use horse and riders and relay stations. But how does the telegraph work? Telegrams are very different to the types of messages you may be familiar with. You're not sending voice or text messages like you do on a phone. You're sending electric signals, either short signals, debt, or long signals, da. In the 1840s, Samuel Morse and Alfred Vail developed Morse code out of D's and da's to be used for their telegraphic system. Combinations of short and long signals represented letters in the alphabet. When grouped together, these letters spell out words and phrases. For a telegraph system to work, you need both a transmitting end and a receiving end. Connecting the two ends, you need a wire or cable. On the transmitting end, attach a battery to a telegraph key or Morse key. The telegraph key has this bar that is held by a spring on one end and a switch on the other. When I press down on the bar, the switch completes a circuit loop with a battery creating an electric current. Here is where I can control how long or short the signal is. If I press down briefly and let the spring retract the bar, it only sends a short electric signal. If I hold down the bar longer, the electric signal is longer. The signal is carried by the cable all the way from the transmitting end to the receiving end. Cables used to stretch all across the country and even stretched under the Atlantic Ocean to Europe, connecting more people to each other and promoting trade. We are using a Morse key, but you can also make your own key using some simple materials. An index card, a hole punch, a paper clip, and metal brads. Punch two holes in the card about an inch apart. Place one brad through each hole and fold the prong so it stays in place. Clip one wire coming from your battery to the first brad. Clip one wire coming from the light bulb to the other brad. Next, unfold a paper clip to make your key. When you touch the paper clip to the brad, you have completed the circuit and can begin sending messages. Today we will be using a light bulb for the receiving end. We will need someone watching the light bulb and writing down the signals. Using Morse code, these signals can be decoded back into letters. Looking at this Morse code chart, I'm going to send a message. See if you could follow along. Just as the telegram advanced communication from the Pony Express, eventually new technology like telephones would match the speed of the telegraph for long distance communication. And while telegrams were faster than mailing letters, they eventually had difficulty keeping up with mail's lower prices. I'm Lynn Heidebaugh, curator at the Smithsonian's National Postal Museum. Hello, I'm Bob Vanderlinden. I'm curator of air transportation and special purpose aircraft at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. One of the airplanes we have on exhibit at the National Postal Museum is the Wiseman Cook airplane. It is often considered the first uh, aircraft to carry airmail, which in fact it did do in uh, California. And Fred Wiseman 
flew it from Petaluma, California to Santa Rosa. It took him two days to go 18 miles because of mechanical issues. The point wasn't for it to be a huge success, it was to show that it could be done. And just to prove that this new technology of flight uh, had a whole host of uh, possibilities, and one of which was the carrying of mail and cargo, as well as passengers. Over the years, they were making the case that they could use airlines to transport the mail regularly. And by 1918, they were given congressional funds to be able to set up the airmail service, which launched in May of 1918 with a flight from Washington, D.C. and New York City. By 1919, 1920, the post office set up a system of routes across the country. You were able to buy airmail stamps because you had to pay extra for this. Put them on an airplane and have your letters delivered across the country. They even pioneered airmail flight at night by setting up airmail beacons that would light the way. With all of these sort of innovations going on, they were needing to expand their services and they turned to contractors. And these contractors were the precursors of uh, today's airlines. What was important was that the airmail contracts provided the airmail carriers a source of steady income, uh, which they did not have before. There were airlines before 1926, but then none of them survived because they couldn't make money just carrying passengers. When the government subsidized the airmail system and subsidized these airmail carriers, they were able to survive. And then later, the federal government encouraged them through uh, different legislation to build bigger aircraft that could carry passengers and cargo to offset the costs. And from that point onwards, the air transportation system was established in the United States. The post office department using contractors to transport the mail was not unique to the commercial aviation industry. Actually, the post office department had used many types of transportation contracts over the years. The post office has traditionally been the tool through which the government has helped to promote communications across the country. Uh, first by building post roads, uh, subsidizing river boats, other ships, uh, railroads, all of that. And the post office department used all these different modes of transportation so that they could reach very different parts of the continental U.S. and its territories. The Postal Service still uses airmail today. It's just not called airmail and there's not a separate postage rate for it, but there is a great volume of mail that does move by air. With air cargo taking off, people were eager to start shipping mail to all corners of the earth. But with all that mail floating around out there, they had to come up with a way to sort packages and letters and make sure they got to where they needed to be on time. We are going to sort the mail. But we are not going to be told how to sort the mail. We know they will all have zip codes on them. Some may match, but they're going to be different sizes and shapes. We are also limited in the space we have to organize and the time we have as the mail goes by. We are gonna problem solve how to sort this mail while it's coming towards us. What strategies are you thinking of? I'm thinking of the end result. We're gonna to have to sort by size and to make sure it gets delivered to the correct zip code. I think we need to look at the task of dividing it up as it comes at us. Well, I guess we're getting ready to go. The mail coming in started simple. This isn't too hard. We had just a series of envelopes with zip codes on them. Beth and I took turns grabbing handfuls of letters and quickly putting them with the zip codes they needed to go to. I don't even can't find this there. <laughs> And I had a lot of trouble trying to keep track of where each zip code was. And those strategies that we talked about earlier? Yeah, we didn't use those once the mail started coming in faster. We also thought we might split up who did what. But the mail just kept on coming. Uh, these are coming in a little. Two, four, one. I was prepared for. But with different sizes of packages there are more boxes. and different more quantities boxes. going to different places, One. we soon became very confused and couldn't no organize. Oh. 
Our first plan, once we started to get boxes, was to place them in their corresponding zip codes, but keep them separate from the regular envelopes. That didn't happen because they were coming in too fast. Zero, zero, one, zero. And we started to miss a few. And then a few more. And then a lot more. Well, I, I guess we're done, but at least we sorted most of the mail. This was much more challenging than I had anticipated. How do you think we could make this more efficient? Repetition would help. I didn't know where the zip codes with these boxes were, so I was running around. And also, if we split out the packages and the letters and did one or the other and not both at the same time, that would have helped. Definitely. How do you think the actual mail is sorted? Communications became the most vital aspect of our economy. The post office became the prime artery of commerce. For a time, the department was perfectly able to keep up. If the mail piled high, put on another piece of equipment. And if that didn't do the trick, add a few more clerks or a flock of carriers. But by World War I, the post office carried more advertising in a week than all the newspapers and magazines could carry in a year. It was the country's bill collector, check deliverer, errand runner. The volume of mail delivered leaped to 20 billion. By 1948, it had doubled, 40 billion. Literally, the post office stands to be swamped, overwhelmed, drowned in a sea of mail. Where do we go from here? The post office and its successor, the United States Postal Service, implemented several innovations to help sort and distribute the mail. One of these is the Zone Improvement Plan, or zip codes. Zip code. Five trailblazing numbers like this one launch every piece of mail with space age speed and precision. Another innovation is optical character recognition. The optical character reading machines in use by the post office department are among the more complex electronic devices. A camera uses software to recognize handwritten letters and translate them into code to compare against a database of known addresses and names. More recently, the Postal Service has introduced barcodes to scan the mail even quicker. Machines can sort 30,000 letters in an hour. The pace and scale of automation in the postal system has exploded. Numbers represent addresses, barcodes represent numbers, machines read barcodes. Mail is taken from mailboxes and brought to processing and distribution centers to be sorted. Mail is sorted first into three categories, letters, flats, and packages. Computers take pictures of stamps and handwriting to digitally locate and match them within the database, determining where they need to go. The parcels are then marked and processed with barcodes and put into a delivery sequence. They are then moved to a loading dock to be delivered to local post offices. In most cases, drivers take sorted mail from local post offices to be delivered to homes. Let's reflect and redesign this demo to work in your classroom. Which of our methods worked really well? Not many. And what's the next step in the process of getting mail to its final destination? Try creating zones in your classrooms that represent different geographical regions. Mountains, islands, plains, or even a place just around the corner. Have your students develop the best modes of transportation for these different locations. Let's look at some different ways mail is delivered in the real world to some of these remote places. Behind us is the Stinson Reliant. Can you tell us about its role in rural mail delivery? Yeah, it was used by a mail contractor from 1939 uh, through the 1940s, and it was used for mostly Appalachian Mountain communities. They had to use an airplane because it was too difficult to get to these places by uh, highways, there were not enough railroads in the area, and there really weren't airplane landing fields for it. And so the, what they would do would be to lower a hook from the airplane, meanwhile somebody on the ground would have strung up a canister of mail that was hanging from some goalpost, 
And so that hook from the airplane had to hit that line just exactly to be able to get that canister and they would pull it up into the airplane. But what are some of the other unique modes of delivering the mail? Well, since the mail has been delivered in America since the colonial times, they've used almost any kind of mode of transportation, horse and rider, and also using other animals for like dog sleds and snowy conditions. But there are areas that uh, can't reach very easily by say a vehicle um, on wheels, you have to go by airplane or you go by um, water. Uh, rails were very important for most of the 19th and early 20th century. Century, railroads connected all of the U.S. speedily and carried huge amounts of mail. And what was amazing on those railway lines is that postal clerks traveled on the trains and processed the mail while they were moving. And so they would get it ready for the next stop and they would pick up mail along the way. Delivering mail inside a city has got some pretty unique challenges too. It does, um, because you can think about the high population density within cities causes traffic as all those vehicles are moving around. Um, and so in the early 20th century, the post office department used pneumatic tube lines under some of the larger urban areas to move the mail under the city's streets. And so it'd be sent by the power of that uh, air moving it through the tube lines and it would go to the next destination where it'd be sorted and then delivered. Like the tubes at a bank? Exactly, like the tubes in a bank. That sounds really convenient. Why don't we do that anymore? Trucks became more available, bicycles, motorcycles, uh, they turned to those kind of vehicles in the city rather than pneumatic tubes which were quite expensive to run. Why is it important to make sure that everybody has access to be able to get their mail? There are some communities where it's difficult to get other communication options. It's also a way that some people who really can't walk to the store and go get things, more rural areas being able to have items delivered to their door is really vital. And the mail provides that in an economical fashion because it's a mandate of the Postal Service to supply the mail at the same rate. So if you pay for a letter going anywhere in the U.S. to another destination in the U.S., it has to cost the same amount. Mailing things to unique locations becomes even more complicated when what you're sending needs to be climate controlled, like shipping ice cream across the country or flying the COVID vaccine around the world. The temperature-controlled supply chain is also known as the cold chain. Here's a snippet from the museum's podcast, Airspace, explaining what happens when you put dry ice in an airplane's cargo hold. And so the cold chain is essentially the infrastructure that allows something to be frozen at its manufacturing plant that allows you to go from source to your kitchen. So even though the original cold chain was designed using liquid nitrogen these days, is much more likely to be dry ice, which is the solid form of CO2. Can you put this specialized cold storage infrastructure onto commercial aircraft with a bunch of passengers and crews? It turns out that CO2 presents some additional challenges and risks that have to be taken into account. Sublimation is when something turns directly from a solid into a gas, but CO2 as it sublimates, and that's when it goes from being a chunk of dry ice that's keeping your vaccine or your dipping dots cold and turns into invisible odorless carbon dioxide. Uh, you have to be careful with the packaging that it doesn't create an overpressure, potential explosion, and packages are designed to alleviate the release of the gas. The key for aircraft transport is the, the quantity of dry ice you have in the volume of carbon dioxide gas that's coming out of the package or a number of packages, uh, where you, you can get the level of carbon dioxide within the aircraft into an unsafe range. And that unsafe range would be, uh, you know, where you would be affecting the, the breathing abilities of the pilots and the crew, and it can also lead to potential asphyxiation. Modern day mail continues to face challenges competing with online and wireless communication systems. But even with new technology, physical mail is still important. While using the mail to communicate by sending letters has steadily decreased, other innovations spurred by the digital age, like online shopping, have increased package shipping. And despite fewer letters, there are still messages being sent and received all the time 
online. Much like the telegraph transformed direct communication through the use of electricity in the 19th century, the advent of email in the 1970s revolutionized how society uses technology to digitally communicate with each other even today. Just imagine if this had existed 224 years ago, the Founding Fathers wouldn't have had to come all the way to Philadelphia on July 4th for the Declaration of Independence. They could have emailed their John Hancocks in. Through the intricate network of the internet, your email is safely routed from one computer server to another, delivering itself almost instantly without any interruptions. As we get farther and farther from Earth, there will be more challenges we'll need to overcome to communicate with each other, including interference caused by atmospheres and solar radiation, higher bandwidths and data rates and latency. Sending messages to and from the International Space Station is nearly instantaneous. But this is done by transmitting signals into space via satellites and receiving them through an advanced network of antennas around the globe. This allows a quick relay of information back to Earth, regardless of where they are in orbit. But the farther we travel into space, the longer it will take a message to get to its intended recipients. Because of this latency, it can take anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes for a message to reach rovers and eventually humans on Mars, depending how close Mars is to Earth in our orbits. I just got an email to let me know that my package from France has arrived. It is amazing the evolution that mail delivery has gone through in the last 100 years. Do you think Ben Franklin could have pictured all of this when he was postmaster? Of course not. In most places, horses have been replaced by planes. Dots and dashes are now zeros and ones. Almost everything is digitized and run by computers but we still need people to keep things going smoothly. Absolutely, and I'll be sure to appreciate it the next time I get a letter, all the work that it took to get it to me. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Well, back in the days of the 13 colonies, cry was freedom and how to defend it. Mailing a letter wasn't much trouble. There weren't too many places to send it. But now it's a different story. They've got more mail than ever before. It's stuffed in bags, stacked on shelves. There's hardly room for anything more. There's been a mail explosion. They've got a terrible load. You've got to help them right away before the use.